Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and for my intro today, I just want to shout out like literally all the trigger warnings in the entire world possible. For those of you that take an interest in true crime, you've probably heard of Albert Fish, AKA the Gray Man, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. So this guy is just pretty much the devil incarnate, all right? now. There's mentions of graphic things being done to minors, including murder and cannibalism, like literally all of it in this video. And if you can't handle that, I more than understand. I myself am kind of interested in some of these weirder, fascinating, and obviously dark true crime stories myself. And I'm trying to understand how some people can really just be this evil. But even I had to take numerous breaks when making this video because of just how disturbing this really is. But with all of that being said, we're going to dive right in. And if you're still here, well, you've been warned. Now, before we get into his absolutely horrific crimes, we're going to talk a bit about who Albert was growing up. He was born in Washington, DC on May 19th, 1870. Apparently his father, Randall, was 43 years older than his mother, Ellen, and was 75 when he was born. His father passed away only five years later. Albert was originally named Hamilton, but changed his name to Albert when he was young because he had a sibling named Albert who passed and he was given the name ham and eggs by other children at an orphanage. His mother had placed him in this orphanage, likely because she was unable to care for four children on her own at the time, and women weren't commonly entering the workforce in that time of life. Now, Albert, as many serial killers do, endured a traumatic childhood, and it's quite frankly the stuff of nightmares. I'm not saying a disturbing past is an excuse or justification by any means for what these people do, but at least it does provide some insight. While at the orphanage, Albert was whipped and beaten, but he discovered he actually enjoyed the physical pain. Apparently the beatings would often give him erections for which the other orphans teased him. Albert was still under the age of 10 here when he was going through all of this. And by all accounts, many of his family members suffered from a variety of mental illnesses as well. I don't think it's a stretch to think that Albert may have been dealing with his own illnesses at the time and wasn't quite sure how to handle things. If he had a sexual masochism disorder, even at a young age, this sort of behavior makes sense. It was said that he began to look to the abuse because it brought him pleasure. When asked about the orphanage, Fish remarked, I was there till I was nearly nine and that's where I got started wrong. We were unmercifully whipped. I saw boys doing many things they should not have done. Now, I'm no psychologist and I don't really know what went on behind the closed doors there. All I know is that things went south very, very fast. So his mother got a government job somewhere around 1879 to 1880 and was able to start looking after him again. And Albert was about 10 at this time. But by the time he was 12, he was in a full-blown sexual relationship with another boy who apparently introduced him to drinking urine and eating feces. Again, absolutely no child should be going through this. It's incredibly disturbing to think that he was only 12 when he was doing this and doing it for sexual gratification. It's absolutely no wonder that some horrific things were normalized to him and truly evil to the extent that he took these things. I don't really have many words and yet we're just getting through the history. According to Fish, in 1890, he relocated to New York, New York and began his crimes against children. He made money working as a prostitute and started to molest boys. He lured children from their homes, tortured them in various ways. His favorite was using a paddle laced with sharp nails and then raped them. Despite this, Albert wasn't the creepy loner you'd think he might've been yet. Even though he was torturing and raping children, that same decade in 1898 was when Albert began to build a family. And this is kind of where my fascination begins, honestly. To see someone so incredibly cold-hearted, so cruel and disturbing, start a family and act normal, and normal enough to have a wife and children is weird and fascinating at the same time. According to one source, he raped and molested many young boys, usually under the age of six. This continued even after his mother arranged a marriage for him and they had started his family. His family life did not change for him in the slightest, the opposite, in fact. After seeing a bisected penis, his taste grew to include sexual mutilation. Other legal troubles seemed to follow him around this time as well. 
Fish was arrested for grand larceny in 1903 and was incarcerated in a Sing Sing prison. Albert had six children, Albert, Anna, Gertrude, Eugene, John, and Henry. He had young boys of his own, but he was still molesting others. And what's seriously disturbing is just seeing a bisection of male genitals in a waxworks museum made him want to do that to others. He apparently tried to castrate an intellectually disabled man to see it for himself, which again is just, insane levels of disturbing. I don't even really know how to react to all of this, but on Murderpedia, we're still in the early life section. I mean, the grand larceny charge seems like nothing compared to what's about to come next. Now, I'm not really sure what to call what does happen in 1910, but we're just, we're just gonna go for it. It's by no means his first crime. He's been molesting and raping children until this point and went to prison for something unrelated. However, in 1910, this is when the homicidal tendencies began to truly show in Albert after he left Thomas Kedden to die. Some sources have said Thomas was a child. Wikipedia states he was 19 and intellectually disabled. Firm Daily calls him a house painter. More sources seem to call him a man, so that's what I'm inclined to believe. They all agree on one thing though. Albert began a sadomasochistic relationship with Thomas, tortured him, cut off half of his genitals, and then wrapped Kedden's penis in a Vaseline-lined handkerchief, tossed him a $10 bill for his trouble, and kissed him goodbye. And that's the part that all the sources agree on, is that. So what? the actual fuck did I just read? I love how Film Daily continues by saying, some say this is when his homicidal urges emerge, like no fucking kidding. Like this is when shit started to go down. This is when things were just starting to get bad. Up until this point, everything I've said, this was bad, but not bad, bad. Now we're getting into bad, bad territory. We are just at the beginning of this Brooklyn vampire story. So yeah, it's, um it's gonna get way worse from here. Thankfully, his wife got the fuck out of this relationship seven years later after the Thomas Kedden incident, and she left him for another man, and it doesn't seem like she knew what was actually happening, but she did run off with someone else, so she must have known something wasn't quite right. This was in 1917, and unfortunately, seemingly because of this, or at least it was made worse because of this situation, he began having auditory hallucinations. At one point, he even recalled wrapping himself in a carpet on the instructions of John the Apostle. His wife also left him with their children, which, yeah, fucking horrible idea. He says he never hurt his own children, but he apparently taught them games with odd masochistic elements to them. According to ThoughtCo, after his marriage ended, Fish wrote to women listed in the personal columns of newspapers, describing in graphic detail the sexual acts he would like to share with them. The descriptions were so vile and disgusting that they were never made public, although they were later submitted as evidence in court. According to Fish, no women ever responded to his letters, asking them for their hand in administering pain. Fish developed a skill for house painting and often worked in states across the country. Some believed he selected states largely populated with African-Americans because he thought police would spend less time searching for the killer of African-American children than of a Caucasian child. And thus he selected black children to endure his torture using his instruments of hell, which included the paddle, a meat cleaver and knives. So at this point, I believe we can accurately add racist to the list for Albert Fish. And that comes, I think as no surprise. He also targeted developmentally disabled children for this exact same reason, thinking that they wouldn't be missed. As a result, he stabbed a young developmentally disabled boy in 1919, though there's little information on the attack. Then five years later, made an attempt to kidnap Beatrice Keel when she was only eight years old. In 1924, Fish offered Beatrice Keel money to help him look for rhubarb in an attempt to lure her away from her parents' farm where she was playing alone. She was on her way to join him and may have never returned when her mother saw her and chased Fish away. Fish returned to the farm later where he tried to sleep in the barn, perhaps in a renewed attempt to abduct the girl. Again, he was chased away, this time by Beatrice's father, Hans Kiel. In the same year, a nine-year-old boy called Francis McDonald was reported missing after he didn't come home from a game of catch with his friends. The other children Francis had been playing with told police that he left with an elderly man with a gray mustache. The story was corroborated by a neighbor who had seen the two of them heading into the woods. 
Francis's mother also recognized the description of the man as she noticed him hanging around the area earlier in that day and quote, mumbling to himself and making queer motions with his hands. A search party found Francis hanging from a tree in the woodland not far from his home. His legs and abdomen were covered with cuts to the extent that his left hamstring was almost entirely stripped away. He had been sexually assaulted and then strangled with his own suspenders. Due to the way many people described the abductor, including Mrs. McDonald's description of him as faded and gray, he became almost a legendary figure in the area the Gray Man. And there we have it, the story of his nickname, the Gray Man. So pardon me while I go fucking vomit. And he wasn't caught for this crime either, not until he was later identified for other crimes that were to happen in the future. His next victim, however, wasn't for another three years. And this would be the crime that earned him the nickname, the Boogeyman. The Charlie Project, a website that lists thousands of cold cases, says that his William or Billy Gaffney was paying with two neighbor boys, a three and 12 year old in Brooklyn, New York on February 11th, 1927. He was just four years old. When the three year old he was playing with asked where Billy went, he said a boogeyman took him. The remains were never found, which is why Billy's case seems to be on Charlie's Project's website. However, the reason they were never found is as fucking grotesque as you can possibly imagine. Now, please know that what I'm about to read is particularly horrific and I don't have words for it, but the horrific words from Albert written to his attorney about Billy Gaffney's death. So this is what I could stand to put in here, but it's much longer and more detailed than I care to share with you all. I brought him to the Riker Ave dumps. There is a house that stands alone, not far from where I took him. I took the boy there, stripped him naked and tied his hands and feet and gagged him with a piece of dirty rag I picked out of the dump. I burned his clothes and took the trolley to 59th and walk there to home. The next day about 2 p.m. I took tools, a good heavy cat of nine tails, homemade. I whipped his bear behind till the blood ran from his legs. I cut off his ears, nose, slit his mouth from ear to ear, gouged out his eyes. He was dead then. I stuck the knife in his belly and drank his blood. I cut him up, came home with my meat. I made a stew out of, well, you know what he's going with here. And I just, I, I'm not reading any more of it. It's gross. He details how he cooked pieces of Billy and that's all you really need to know. This monster didn't even see this poor four-year-old as a human. I, I've covered a lot of shit on this channel, but this is one of the few that is so extremely grotesque that it just doesn't even seem real. And I think that's how Billy Gaffney's mother may have felt too. There's a part on Wikipedia that says she wasn't convinced that this was her son's killer, though there's no citation. So it may have only been a rumor that, you know, the writer put in there. But if I were this little boy's mother, I'd absolutely want to believe the same. I'd want to believe just about anything else other than him encountering and dying to this kind of monster. Now, I really, really wish I could say this is where it ends, but it doesn't. Shortly before the murder that would ultimately lead to his arrest, Albert attempted to test his implements of hell on a child he had been molesting named Cyril Quinn. Quinn and his friend were playing box ball on the sidewalk when Fish asked them if they had eaten lunch. When they said they had not, he invited them into his apartment for sandwiches. While the two boys were wrestling on Fish's bed, they dislodged his mattress. Underneath was a knife, a small handsaw, and a meat cleaver they became frightened and ran out of the apartment. And honestly, thank God that they ran. I don't even want to imagine what would have happened had they stayed. After what he did to other children we've mentioned, Quinn and his friend were lucky to escape with their lives. But unfortunately, his next victim didn't have that kind of luck. On May 25th, 1928, Albert saw an ad in the paper from an 18 year old man, Edward Budd, looking for work. He said he was looking to hire someone and introduced himself as Frank Howard. His intentions were sinister and he did mean to harm Edward, but he changed his target upon meeting Edward's younger sister, 10 year old Grace. And this shit makes my stomach churn just because I already know what's gonna happen and it's it's bad guys. He told the family that following week he would return and he would take Edward out to his farm to start working. He failed to show on the day promised, but he did send a telegram apologizing and set a new date. When he showed on the second day, he brought gifts for all the Bud children. He seemed like the typical loving grandfather to the Bud family. 
After lunch that day, Fish explained to the family that he had to attend a children's birthday at his sister's home. He said he would be back later that day to pick up Edward to take him to his farm. He then asked that Bud allow him to take their oldest daughter, Grace, with him to the birthday party. They agreed to let her go, not suspecting anything. They dressed her in her best Sunday clothes. Grace left the house with Mr. Fish for the last time. Little Grace Bud was never seen alive again. And this case went on for two years until someone was arrested, but it wasn't Albert Fish that was arrested. Instead, it was a man named Charles Edward Pope. He was accused by his estranged wife, despite having nothing to do with the case whatsoever. He was found not guilty, but still spent 108 days in jail until his trial. And this is where the case could have gone cold. It definitely would have, honestly. If they didn't suspect Albert earlier, why suspect him after already arresting someone else? But for some reason, I'm not sure I'll fully understand. Albert incriminated himself. Maybe he wanted the credit. Maybe he wanted to hurt Grace's family further. I'm not 100% sure, but he wrote them a letter one just as disgusting as the one he would later write to his lawyer about Billy. And it read the following. My dear Mrs. Bud, in 1894, a friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on a steamer Tacoma Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco to Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the boat was gone. At that time, there was a famine in China. Meat of any kind was one to three dollars a pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under 12 were sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body and is sold as veal cutlets, brings the highest price. John stayed here so long that he acquired a taste for human flesh. Upon his return to New York, he stole two boys, one seven, one eleven. Several times every day and night, he thanked them, tortured them to make their meat good and tender. He told me so often how good human flesh was and I made up my mind to taste it. On June 3rd, 1928, I called on you at 406 West 15th Street and brought you pot cheese and strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat on my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her. On the pretense of taking her to a party, you said yes, she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in the closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run down the stairs. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. I choked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take the meat to my rooms, cook and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her, though I could have if I wished. She died a virgin. And this is where I take another fucking break because I just can't anymore. I seriously needed a long, long break after reading this and processing what I had read. A human being actually wrote this to a grieving mother six years after her 10-year-old daughter went missing. I can't imagine how fucking distraught this mother would be reading this and being taunted by this monster. If there's even a sliver of good that came out of this letter, it is the fact that it is what caused Albert Fish to get arrested. The letter was in an envelope with the logo of the New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association emblazoned on it. And thank God the police were able to use this to catch him. The trail led to a janitor that owned the stationery. The stationery was often left in a rooming house and Albert Fish often used and rented that space. Now, here's how I know that Fish was actually fucking insane. I know the word insane gets thrown around a lot and I don't just mean, oh my God, he's really fucking strange. I mean, he's literally unhinged. Apparently, when a chief investigator asked if he could question Fish, Fish agreed, but then brandished a razor blade at him. When he was disarmed, he just confessed like, 
he didn't seem to be one of those eerily smart serial killers that gets away with it and never admits to anything, even when he's suspected. He just, he just admitted it right off the bat the second he was disarmed. Around the time of the trial is when the truth about Fish began to come to light. Not only what he did to others, but what he did to himself. An image of his pelvic X-ray had been on almost every website that I've found about Fish. He had 29 needles completely embedded in his belly, legs, and hip. He would also shove sharp needles up and under his spine, all because he was that masochistic. Fish's trial began in March, 1935 and lasted for 10 days. Fish pleaded insanity, citing the voices that he'd believed had belonged to God and the saints telling him to kill, mutilate, and molest children. It was argued that Fish believed that if God did not approve of his child sacrifices, that they would be prevented by angels. Similarly to the story of Abraham and Isaac in the Bible, Fish was found to be sane and guilty. Some of the jurors later explained that they did not doubt that Fish was insane, but that by declaring him as such, they would allow him to live. Instead, he was given the death sentence. He spent the rest of the year in Sing Sing prison and was executed via electric chair on January 16th, 1936. Upon his death, his lawyer was given Fish's final statement, but refused to show anyone, describing it as the most filthy string of obscenities he had ever read. When he died, Fish had three confirmed and five suspected murder victims, and he claimed to have assaulted around 100 children. He was described by the New York Daily Mirror as the most vicious child slayer in criminal history. Now, I don't know if I agree that he was sane. I really do not want to celebrate someone being executed, but I'm most certainly not sad either. Not only was there Francis, Billy, and Grace, but Albert also confessed to murdering Emma Richardson, five years old, on October 3rd, 1926. Emil Ayling, age four, murdered July 13th, 1930. Robin Lane Liu, age six, murdered May 2nd, 1931. Yetta Abramowitz, age 12, murdered 1927. Mary Ellen O'Connor, age 16, murdered on February 15th, 1932 and Benjamin Collings, age 17, murdered December 15th, 1932. Some psychiatrists did testify that Albert was legally insane in court, but ultimately none of us can really say for certain. Fish did seemingly try to behave normal at times. He actually remarried in 1930 after he murdered Grace, but before he sent the letter. However, Estella Wilcox divorced him after only a week and Fish had been arrested for obscene letters only a few months later and observed at a psychiatric hospital. Some say that since he was released from the psych ward so soon, he must have been extremely deceptive. I don't know if it's that, his unassuming presence or what, but obviously I wasn't there and we can't know what the hell he said to those nurses that had him released or everything he had said in that courtroom that deemed him insane. His last words in the electric chair were reportedly, I don't even know why I'm here. One witness even said that it took two jolts of electricity before Fish died, creating a false rumor that the apparatus was short-circuited by the needles in his body. And honestly, I... <laughs> I don't really know what to make of this. It's extremely disturbing to see how traumatic past events can shape someone's future and how whatever illnesses Fish may have had were so just out of control. There really is no excuse for murdering children and it's extremely despicable. And the fact that they didn't even have a chance to live their lives is beyond sad. But what he did to their bodies, the torture he put them through, it's, I'm just beyond words with this whole situation. So. That's where I'm ending today's video. Someone suggested that I research Albert Fish in my Discord server and I did and I, I don't know how to feel about this. Um, it was something I didn't know about beforehand and something that I wish I didn't know about today. So just to let you guys know, there, there's a pretty decent documentary out there about Fish and it has really low ratings because there's claims that it glorifies or over dramatizes his actions. And I know that it's been a discussion lately um, you know, to stop glorifying serial killers. And I kind of hope that that's what this video did instead. I, I hope it condemned him and maybe shed some light on why Albert Fish became the Brooklyn vampire, the gray man or the boogeyman to even begin with. So thank you guys so much for watching. 
I'm gonna go ahead and get some eye bleach and watch, you know, happy animal videos with Casper in my lap for a little bit. Maybe check out his channel. Maybe go check out Sagmo for your own version of eye bleach. But I love you guys. Thanks for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys. Thank you.